Good afternoon, and welcome to HealthSystemCIO.com All-Star Panel on Care Team Collaboration. Let's talk IT and clinical strategies, a complimentary webinar from HealthSystemCIO.com sponsored by Perfect Serve Inc. Just some housekeeping before we get started. My name is uh, Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I will be your moderator today. We're going to encourage you to go ahead and ask questions. You can type them in as they occur to you in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and leave the default set to all panelists. We'll take those later in the program. You can download the deck using the URL on your screen. We've also got a shortened URL at the bottom of each slide. And we are recording today's event, so you'll get an email as soon as our archive is ready, usually within two business days, if not sooner, and we'll get that posted to our YouTube channel before you. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, we're going to go for about 45 minutes, 45 to 50 minutes. First, we're going to have our panel discussion with Alex Rodriguez, VP and CIO at St. Elizabeth Healthcare. Shahid Shah, co-founder and CEO of NetSpective Communications, and Terry Edwards, president and CEO of PerfectServe. So without further delay, we are going to jump right into our questions. And I want to start off uh, with Alex. Alex, give us a quick overview of your organization, if you would. Sure. Thank you. Uh, St. Elizabeth was founded in 1861, and we're located in the northern Kentucky, greater Cincinnati metropolitan area. We have seven facilities in northern Kentucky and in uh, uh, some locations in Cincinnati itself. Uh, we're about 1,200 beds with a physician organization that complements the three hospitals with 400 mid-level providers and physicians in about 97 primary care office locations. Uh, we have about 1.2 billion in revenue that gives you a sense of size for the organization and uh, it has been a relative, it's been an innovative organization. Uh, the organization has been accredited with magnet status for its third year in a row, so we take a, a lot of care of the associates and we're very proud of those folks that take care of our patients. Very good, excellent. Shahid? Hi guys, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm really excited about uh, talking about the communications today. So as you can see, communications is, the na is in the name of our company and we focus a lot on helping uh, innovators uh, craft their strategies for how to connect uh, patients and providers, providers to providers, through conversational UIs, uh, new modern uh, uh, communication strategies. So we do uh, a couple of different things. One is we help figure out who's doing what kind of conversations, and then we help figure out what are the right technologies associated with those conversations. So um, if you guys have heard, you know, many of you have probably seen over the last few days uh, Microsoft having gotten into trouble with their new chatbot called Tay, T-A-Y, <laughs> and that's in a direction in which uh, most people are going to be heading over the next few years is how to do automated text-based communications uh, between a variety of different uh, care team members. And so that's an area that we're right in the middle of. We help uh, with uh, strategy architecture, engineering, and building of those systems. Excellent. All right, great. Terry? Um, thank you, uh, and delighted to, to be here uh, today, Anthony, and, and to join uh, Alex and uh, Shahid. Um, so, well, PerfectServe was really born out of the need to overcome communication barriers in, in healthcare uh, uh, I really identified some of the challenges several years ago uh, prior to starting the, the company um, back in the 1990s. My wife was a registered nurse and worked for a solo practice pediatrician, and she would occasionally take call for this position on the weekends, and I uh, observed that process and how cumbersome it was and, and convoluted uh, it was. And so the, the idea uh, behind the company was really about fixing that and using technology-based platform to, to, to fix that. And what has happened over the years is PerfectServe really has uh, evolved to uh, become um, what we think is one of the most advanced care team collaboration platforms in the, in the industry uh, with secure uh, messaging and other types of capabilities built in for nurses and, and physicians and, and all care team members. And what makes the, the platform unique is um, uh, our ability to uh, 
automatically identify and then provide an immediate connection to the right care team member uh, through a, a capability we call um, dynamic intelligent routing. So we're, we're currently serving um, many of the leading health systems in the country, uh, including St. Elizabeth. Uh, we have uh, over 100,000 users on the platform uh, today, um, about 125 different health systems and hospitals, and uh, some 15,000 uh, practices and post-acute care providers. Excellent, excellent, great. All right, let's uh, let's starting uh, getting into it, Alex. Um, we've got a problem, right? I mean, people like Terry and organizations like his are looking to solve something. So, in your opinion, where is the breakdown occurring in care team communication and why? Yeah, um, you know, this can't say it's a relatively new issue. It's been an issue that we've has struggled as an industry for a long time. But uh, when you think about the number of folks that are involved in the uh, communication process, I still think that provider, direct provider to provider communication is primarily uh, this, the predominant issue. And uh, when you think about some of those processes between provider to provider, I think it's more pronounced when we get into uh, handoffs, especially between the floors and surgery. So. Uh, most definitely, we have a, a, a pressing problem. Um, I think one of the ways we're addressing that is probably getting away or going back to, I should say, uh, some traditional rounding practices. So for teaching hospitals, I think the, uh, the practice of rounding has been an established culture. But for community hospitals, we seem to have gotten around, uh, away from rounding. Rounding has gotten pretty difficult, especially with the area of uh, uh, hospitals taking care of uh, patients and a lot of the primary care uh, physicians no longer being part of that care team in a direct model. So we still have quite a bit of communication processes uh, that are that are giving us trouble, but I would predominantly say it's still in the realm of provider to provider rather than uh, provider to the uh, more extended uh, care team like uh, nurses. Very good, very good. All right, Terry, um, you're going into many organizations uh, with your products. You're talking to them about their problems, looking to see if there's a fit. Uh, what are you seeing? Uh, what are the commonalities you're seeing about the problems people are having in this area? Well, PerfectServe um, started by uh, addressing um, communication-driven workflows around physicians. And uh, it's, it's inter interesting as you, uh, we have been in the market for a while and observed how it has evolved. Um, we really, we really kind of come from the point of view where right now the, the industry is fragmented. So we have uh, solutions and technologies that are focused on the doctor and they're fragmented. Uh, we have solutions that are focused on nursing uh, and nursing, for example, in the acute care environment. We have um, really seen a surge uh, in uh, mobile apps and secure messaging. Uh, and then there's uh, uh, challenges in the whole area of uh, alerts and, uh, and alarms and middleware. And I, and I think that these fragmented technologies have fragmented the communication and made it difficult for uh, uh, providers to uh, more easily connect with each other. And, you know, as Alex said earlier, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, a year ago, we commissioned a uh, Harris poll that uh, studied uh, or surveyed nearly a thousand healthcare professionals in both the, the hospital acute care setting as well as the medical practice setting. And some of the findings were really insightful. The whole study was really around the role of, of care team collaboration and communication on population health business models. And some of the high level summaries were there was strong uh, opinion with some 97% of those uh, agreeing that um, uh, effective care team collaboration and communication is really key to enabling population health management, but there was also strong agreement that the current state of, uh, of technology in the industry was impeding the, uh, the industry's ability to move forward. And, and 
when we drilled a little bit further, what we saw was uh, uh, strong agreement too that there are multiple disparate technologies that don't talk to each other. For example, as I described earlier, there's nursing solutions, there's physician solutions, they don't always work together. Um, but also, um, in the communications that, um, or the communication workflows that really uh, support care delivery processes, um, many times the initiator does not always know who the right care team member is that they need to contact. And uh, so just, just being able to do that and do that in a, uh, in, in, in a reliable way is a, uh, is a challenge. We feel like we've solved for some of that um, historically uh, with what we've done around physicians and now we're expanding that to, to, to embrace the rest of the care team. Very good, very good, thank you. Um, Shahid, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Shahid, uh, we're talking about, again, solving a problem. Um, and so in the past, where do you think the disconnect's been between what vendors are providing and what providers needed? Yeah, I think it's, uh, T Terry uh, said it uh, pretty nicely, is that I think if we summarize uh, the key issue, it is that communications in healthcare is a multi-institution, multi-stakeholder problem but many of the solutions have been focused on a specific vertical, patient to patient or physician to physician. But what we recognize is that if we take a look at where failures occur and where the biggest uh, impact of those failures are, we might be able to focus in a proper direction. So for example, we know that communications failures account for easily 20 or 30% of all uh, malpractice uh, suits. In fact, if you do, as you look at uh, research that's been done over the last few years, it turns out that uh, if you were to look at why uh, a particular medication error was done or some other problems occurred uh, in which a lawsuit was filed, it, it boils down uh, the, the failure mode analysis that shows that about 20 to 30 percent of that was communication. So, for example, did information that got put into an EHR actually make it to uh, providers and to patients? Uh, did test results actually uh, co cover uh, all of the information that they needed, and they, did they get uh, in there as a timely, in a timely fashion? Are uh, patients uh, who are complaining about satisfaction or other things putting information in a place, and is that being communicated properly to the right teams? So one of the problems that many vendors have in this space is they think of this as a solution first, where they say, okay, I've got um, – a uh, messaging system or I've got, you know, whether it's a telephone or messaging or SMS or a two-way chat, having a solution and then hoping uh, that someone uh, figures out where all the needs are and tying that together is a problem. Maybe, you know, PerfectServe does a good job in this area where they're not just saying, here's a solution, go figure out how to use it. They actually tie these things together. So when you look at the failures in communications and the amount of money that's associated with that in the surgery area, general medicine, nursing, uh, obstetrics, if you start to break this down and say, okay, are we dealing with a surgical communication problem or are we dealing with a nursing communication problem? Are we dealing with admin communications? And when vendors tie all of these uh, together, lump all of these together, I should say, if you do it in a, in a proper fashion and you tie it properly, it's not that bad. But if you just lump it together, uh, it, makes, it makes it very difficult. Uh, so just extending on some examples, there are about half the cases for uh, malpractice suits for communication-related things where provider-to-provider -provider communications are the issue, and, and, and the other half is provider-to-patient. So either two providers didn't uh, properly communicate with each other, which is what led to an error or something like that, uh, or the provider forgot to tell the patient something um, in an institution capacity. And when you look at those and you start to break down, well, why did it occur? What was the provider to provider? What was the provider to patient? And you say things like, you know, uh, provider to patient is inadequate consent or unsympathetic responses or poor documentation. That starts to lay out and say, you know, like you asked a great question, which is what's the, what's the, what are the vendors not doing correctly? What they're not doing correctly is isolating the issues tying it to specific jobs that need to be done by physicians and their institutions and patients, and then carving out specific use cases that say, here's a solution for this use case, here's a solution for that use case, because in the end, it's a multi-institution, multi-stakeholder problem, and that's not easy to solve. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Thing, 
And Anthony, Scott I think Alex. one more comment. Yeah, one more comment to make around that. Bo both uh, earlier remarks too. You know, one of the things that we've taken uh, into account a lot of the focus is in those communications. The other breakdown is being succinct in the communication and having a reliable format that nurses are respective uh, or, or, or taken into consideration how the message is going to be interpreted by the provider. So you know, it, a lot of the applications have, n have been really freeform text where the you know the recipient of the text message isn't quite sure how the format of the message is going to arrive where the content's going to be in the message and all those uh, 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 systematic processes that we're used to having in uh, the healthcare uh, transaction is, is missing in this whole new social media. So uh, we've actually been trying to incorporate more of our SBAR kind of content delivery into our formatted messages so that the audience has a consistent delivery of uh, what they're getting. Yeah, great point. Excellent. That is, that's, Excellent. A, that's a very good point. Terry, did you want to jump in, or you good? I, I, I did have just one other comment on following up with uh, the previous question um, and Shahid's uh, talking about drilling down into specific use cases, and he's exactly right. Um, but one other thing that I think is a challenge that the industry wrestles with is it will oftentimes attempt to look for and deploy uh, and then fail to actually uh, have successful deployments, point solutions to certain problems. Um, and I'm, I'm reminded uh, uh, many years ago when we first enter, entered the hospital enterprise space, I had a meeting with um, one of our uh, chief medical officers at a very large uh, health system up in Detroit, and he was all frustrated with the uh, the communication uh, problem around critical test results. And we did a, uh, and he was looking for a critical test results management communication solution. We did a, um, a survey uh, uh, of the current processes, and what we really found is that they had just an underlying fundamental structural communication problem, and if they fixed that, they would probably be well on their way to solving their critical test result. Uh, communication challenge. Very good. Very good. All right. We're going to go with Alex on this one. Alex, it seems that and now the clinical workflow is what's driving the technology, as it probably should be. Is that correct? And, and how is it playing out? Yeah, it's, this, is a, this is a troublesome one for me because what we have seen is the clinical workflows, especially in the, if you take the broader context of where a lot of the uh, health systems have been evolving, so you have acquisitions of uh, hospitals into existing IDNs, you have newly formed IDNs, and a lot of those clinical workflows internally we still lack a lot of consistency within in a, uh, the original health system, and then as you add uh, uh, additional hospitals to those health systems, those workflows are going to vary from, from uh, health system to health system, and if we have uh, providers in that market that overlap in those areas, you have different, you know, the whole workflow process just becomes exponentially more difficult to manage. So what we have at least done in, in our space of the world is really paid attention to how those clinical workflows are managed. Um, and that drives all the way from uh, consistency of technology and uh, uh, we spend a lot of time centralizing. Uh, so in the healthcare space, you know, the mantra has always been to uh, standardize to see you can centralize, to you can virtualize. And we <laughs> kind of follow that methodology in, in our space quite a bit. You know, we pay attention to the standardization of the processes so we can centralize the technology delivery of those processes. And eventually, I, I'm not sure if it was Shahid or, but uh, made a comment about where Microsoft and others, some uh, technology vendors are headed, but you know you can imagine that this space is going to be highly uh, virtualized in the, in the next you know few years. So it's hard to get there if you don't pay attention to those those uh, predecessor events to help you manage that transition. Very good, 
Very good. All right, let's go over to Terry. Um, Terry, you want to talk a little bit about uh, the care team, the definition, how it's changed, key players, and um, how it's evolved, things like that. Well, you know that's that's a that's a that's a good question, um, uh, and and I think what we've seen is first first off, just introducing the concept of team um, uh, is, is being adopted more heavily and has has been in recent years and uh, uh, it, it's expanded from you know just the uh, the nurse and the doctor to the ancillary uh, uh, clinicians who are also providing services uh, and and as we look at um, the whole continuum it, it, it the care team evolves and changes as one would transition from the acute care environment out to the post acute care environment but I also think we're we're seeing uh, a need to emphasize the role of the family uh, as part of the care team uh, as well. Um, and I, 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 I am joined with me uh, also um, uh, our Vice President of Client Experience, uh, Terry Hayes. Terry's a, a nurse, a former hospital uh, chief nursing uh, executive, and uh, she's, she's responsible for leading all of our implementations. And I'd, I'd ask Terry, if she wouldn't mind um, uh, uh, coming on this uh, question as well, because it's an important one. Absolutely, thank you, Terry. Um, I've been a I'm a nurse practitioner, and I've been a nurse for many, many years, and we've seen an evolution of how care is provided, and thus how what the composition of a care team is. And so it's not just a nurse and a physician taking care of a patient. There's physical therapy, pharmacy, respiratory therapy, uh, case managers, care team coordinators, and extending that um, care beyond the walls of the hospital. So care team and the communications amongst the care team have to expand um, appropriately. It's a very complex process, and at the center of it always is the patient and the patient doesn't exist in isolation in, in the hospital. Very good, very good. All right, let's move over to you, Alex. Um, in your experience, what strategies have you found to be most successful in collaborating with the clinical team to roll out new technology, always a dicey proposition, and how do you work with your clinical leaders? Sure. The uh, One of the things I think the healthcare system is uh, doing a better job at is managing projects, and a lot of times everybody knows the story of, you know, massive IT project failure. Well, mm -hmm. you know, we have inst instituted the uh, the culture here of uh, there's no project that's an IT project, uh, projects or business projects or clinical projects. They're not IT projects. So we have engaged uh, from the get-go, uh, you know, pretty rigorous, systematic approach to how we do projects uh, for technologies such as the one we're talking about today, we also take a very incremental approach to how we manage that project. If we're unsure about our clinical workflows and how they're going to support the technology, we have a tendency to uh, start small and go with proof of concept. Uh, along with the proof of concept, uh, thank, thankfully we've had, uh, for, for being a community hospital, some very highly engaged physicians. Uh, they were part of the journey with us uh, when we uh, grew as an organization through merger. They grew with us through the, through the acquisition and implementation of our EMR, which happens to be EPIC. And uh, we have a core group that uh, of about 20 docs that have stayed with us throughout that uh, entire journey. Uh, they are uh, uh, more of the uh, technology uh, enabled, uh, enab uh, view technology as enablers for uh, clinical process transformation, so they uh, they see where things could uh, could change, and they've been engaged, and we definitely uh, rely on them as part of the process. Uh, same can be go, uh, said with our clinical nurses and our clinical administrative leads. They're part of the project, so we define the project structure and back again to expectations and expectations with our vendors. Uh, we define the scope of the project from the onset, so half the battle is just defining the problem that you're trying to solve, and we spend a lot of time asking ourselves what problem are we trying to solve before we acquire the technology, before we deploy the technology. So we, we spend quite a bit of time up front just figuring out what is it that we want to change. 
Terry, you want to talk a little bit about the clinical perspective? Yeah, sure. And, and I'll, I'll, yeah, Terry Hayes, I'm going to pass that over to you, so you please go ahead. Terry Hayes okay. was grabbing it anyway. Go ahead, Terry. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. He, he just he just said clinical. <laughs> but that's right. I think, I think it's a well-known fact that engagements, uh, the engagement of clinicians and decision-making around technologies that, that potentially impact patient care is essential for the ultimate adoption of any kind of technology. And organizations such as um, St. Elizabeth and the strategy that Alex talked about is, is kind of key because involving key stakeholders in the decision-making process while guiding the correct business, clinical, operational, or financial reason for the purchase of the technology is key. It's that balancing act. And I think involving clinical champions in solution configuration and deployment ultimately promotes end user engagement and buy-in. And, you know, surprisingly, an approach that, that we oftentimes find beneficial is to selectively engage those that are opposed to the technology in the deployment and the solution configuration. Because um, while that is challenging, when a naysayer mm -hmm. becomes a convert and an ultimate champion, it really helps the others um, see the benefits more clearly. So I think that it's oftentimes a very effective strategy. And then I think in any um, implementation of any any product, support of leadership at the organizational level often determines the outcome of the project. And rollout of technology is a collaborative process between leadership, the project team, the end users, and the vendor. So I agree that strong executive support, a very clear project plan, and frequent updates to the stakeholders that facilitate a smoother rollout. Uh, I, I have to say that I think clinician input should never be ignored or minimized, nor should the realities of IT and opera, operationalizing a technology platform. And then I, finally, as a vendor, I think that we, we have to remain vigilant and respectful of competing IT priorities and demands at the system level and work within the boundaries set by the organization. Um, it's also incumbent on the vendor to provide consultative services and provide guidance on how best to leverage the technology to promote and, and enhance the clinical workflow rather than ever asking someone to change clinical workflow for the sole purpose of meeting a technology. So it's, it, it's um, a continual balance. Very good. Very good. All right, Shahid, I want to bring you back in here as an expert in vendor relationships. What advice can you give as far as establishing a strong partnership with your, with your vendor in this area? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and it's such a pleasure uh, to be following uh, Perfect Serve here because uh, they clearly are a mature uh, vendor in this space. And if you're lucky enough to work with them, that's great. But in case uh, you're looking at others, just remember one thing, and that is that it's very easy to get into messaging technologies, but very hard to get out. And what I mean by that is messaging is um, deceptively simple in the sense of, hey, you know, it's just a couple of messages that I'm sending back and forth like SMS or instant messaging or uh, those kind of things. So deceptively easy to get in, but it's hard to get out, which means that if you chose the wrong vendor in the beginning, uh, how do you stay, how do you get all your data, who owns that data, where is the uh, data being kept, you know, whether it's on the cloud or on premises. So these are things you want to make sure of very, very uh, at, at, the at the beginning because these are pilots. Pilots start small and they can grow very quickly because people need these tools really, really uh, heavily and they start using it quicker than uh, often the IT team can coordinate. I, I heard a, a very funny uh, anecdote at uh, HIMSS uh, just the last month that there are more pilots in healthcare than in the airline industry. Now, when you, when you hear that, uh, what that basically means is <laughs> lots of people are trying lots of different things. So one of the first things to say is, okay, if we're trying this, how does this actually move from a pilot into a production environment and who owns that data and where it goes? And what that specifically means is what kind of specific stakeholders can this technology support? So can it support, and I think uh, both Terry's mentioned that the family is a big deal. I, ca I call them the five Ps. So you have a patient, 
you have a provider, you have a payer, uh, the insurance companies, you have uh, pharmacies and um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. There's a lot of clinical trials and other things going on that people have to connect to. And the last one is acute uh, P, which is PH for family, P-H-A-M-I-L-Y. So if you think about these five or six Ps, these are all the different uh, stakeholders, and they each work at different institutions. So as you're trying a technology, you start to say to yourself, okay, if I can get this started really quickly in my division, in my organization, my unit, uh, et cetera, how quickly can I move to the other Ps of the um, uh, patient provider, pharmacy, et cetera, kinds of, of uh, stakeholders? And then can I, through data sharing and data use and, and sharing agreements, connect multiple institutions so that messages that go from uh, patient to provider can then be picked up by the payers or uh, another big, uh, I just spent a couple of days here this week at the National Association of Accountable Care Organizations. Patient communication is a major uh, problem for them because they are starting to bear risk on uh, their patients and they need to be well connected in the, in the care team. So as you start to look at that, you say, all right, if I, if I can bring in multiple stakeholders, multiple institutions, and I, and I have a good solid idea of who owns the data, how well can it integrate into my current systems uh, and my legacy systems, my future systems? Immediate integration is a key thing to take a look at, especially during the pilot phase. I, I don't recommend ever doing the integration in the pilot, but you know, be ready to say, as this moves into production, can this technology be ready to be integrated? And which use cases are we going to do integration in? So if we've got uh, summarization, is that uh, uh, communication going to go back into the EHR? Does it go into lab systems, radiology impact systems, patient portals? There's a lot of probably about 20 or 30 systems that may need to get integrated. And lastly, uh, I would say, can we b build our own technologies on top of this solution? So when you look at new uses and new use cases that you didn't think about, often what will that, what that will mean is if you didn't choose right, it means you have to throw something out and bring something in instead of building on top of it. So that all has to be accounted for. And then from a pricing perspective, this is very important to ask about is that as the number of participants and stakeholders and institutions grows, you have to say, are we priced at a per message? Are we priced, like SMS messages, for example, are often priced at, at, at a per message, uh, and instant messaging is often priced at a per user within the institution. And so, you know, big companies like Microsoft and guys like PerfectServe, these, they, they understand this pricing model really well. What you'd have to ask yourself is as you're growing across institutions, as the care team grows, as you go uh, to multiple stakeholders, that can grow pretty fast. Like every one patient might have 15 family members that need to be kept informed of something. So is that 15 plus one equals 16 plus the number of people in the care team? Is that how you're going to price this out? Uh, or is the pricing model uh, more based on utilization of the number of messages passed back and forth? So this I've seen get people get people tripped up pretty quickly because they thought it was a small project that got really, really expensive. And then what happens is, is that as soon as it gets expensive, you cut back and then basically who are getting big benefit from this by saying, no, no, you can't use this as much because we can't, uh, we can't afford it. So there's a bunch of things to think about, uh, but I think uh, you heard uh, you know, from PerfectServe here that these are easy to solve um, if you have a good solid conversation around use cases and making sure that the vendor and the uh, customer are fully aligned on what the purposes are around those use cases, integrate well, and make sure that it's uh, growth friendly and things go really well in this sector then. Excellent. Excellent advice. Really appreciate that. All right. Now we're going to go over to Terry. Terry, let's talk a little bit about uh, ben benchmarks. What are the benchmarks that can help organizations understand how effective they're being and where they can improve or target certain, certain areas? Well, I, I think um, um, when it comes to the, 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 the communications technologies, um, as you as you, as one roll, and this isn't just communication, but really anything. As you would roll out uh, new technology, the the first thing to look at is is it being adopted. I look at what we do so much, and while there's this, there's certainly a technology component of it, it's really about change management more than anything else. And so, with change management, are the tools or is the technology being adopted? And so we, we look at um, the analytics, for example, that we're getting off of our uh, system. It, it's, it, it's, it's been kind of amazing to me that we can look at a number of factors such as um, 
uh, the number of beds that an organization has, its annual ED visits, uh, and its annual admissions. And we can uh, pretty accurately predict the volume of communication events that should be occurring in, uh, in that organization. And so just by being able to say that, you know, this, this hospital here that's 350 beds, for example, should, should probably be generating some five to 600 uh, nurse to physician communication events every day. Uh, we'll, we'll use the analytics to compare new implementations uh, to existing established implementations. Uh, and, and, and then if we're, we're short, then we, you know, we look at departments, for example, and, uh, uh, and work with the clinicians to drive the change. But then also we look at the, the quality of the communications, what the, what the modalities are that are being used and, and adopted. So uh, paging versus secure text messaging versus live phone calls and things like that. So those, those, uh, th that's data that's readily available off of our platform. We, we basically use it to drive improvements in the communications process. And then there are different measures that are more outcome focused and uh, that's, that's when we look at, you know, what we might be doing in a particular process. Uh, and and, and, and those, are, those are typically clinical processes. And maybe, Terry Hayes, I'll let you uh, elaborate uh, uh, on the outcome-focused measures. Sure. Um, so communication is so critical to um, any kind of care. So in facilitating communication in a timely manner can reduce time to treatment and reduced time to treatment often um, yields a better patient outcome. Um, increased nursing productivity by not having the nurse stuck in the middle of physician-to-physician uh, -physician communication or searching for a physician for, to, to message and then actually getting the wrong physician and starting the process over. Um, there's a, a potential impact to throughput or, or that especially pesky care transition times where, um, you know, we can take that SBAR notification and, and provide that in a, a, a real-time manner to the clinician. And reaching the correct provider and the timely transmission of any relevant clinical data really contributes to positive interactions. Um, another thing that uh, that um, clients use and um, it's very beneficial are our team alerts around uh, rapid response teams or our, our code stroke or STEMIs or sepsis and um, that can also speed time to treatment, um, ultimately speed time to discharge or transfer. So um, the key clinical communications and facilitating those workflows should ultimately benefit and enable patient care. Very good, Alex. You want to weigh in on this benchmarks issue? Yeah, it's uh, one of the things that uh, we're doing, uh, and it's an evolving conversation. So we're not quite there with uh, with our messaging platforms, but eventually we're trying to get a perspective of how well utilized all our applications are and the eff eff efficacy of the of the application. So if people can kind of envision that that typical gardener, uh, you know, uh, magical square where everybody wants to lead to the uh, upper right hand corner, we're we basically are putting together profiles of our customer sets. So for our EMR adoption is you can imagine a, a, a scatter diagram of graph that says how much time is being spent in an application and what is the efficacy in terms of what is the length of stay for a certain provider, how much time are they in the EMR, if there's high utilization of the EMR but, uh, but ineffective productivity measures, you fall to the lower left-hand corner, and we're starting to spend a lot more time with our different customer sets to say, why is it that we have a population in the, uh, in the lower left? How do we move them to the upper right? And uh, eventually, I can see that uh, methodology uh, uh, pertaining to messaging as well, saying, 
you know, if we get a lot of, if you look at globally our adoption of messaging platform, you'll see some global numbers, but we haven't really evolved into, okay, is one, you know, is a certain section of our audience the predominant uh, population of users and how much of that volume is being driven by them as opposed to our low productivity users that have some low outcomes that could, uh, uh, benefit by having a little more focus time. That that's the methodology that we would like to see most of our applications evolve to. Very good. Now, before we move to, uh, to our final slide, I just want to remind the audience that if you do have any questions, go ahead, send them in the Q and A box, and we'll get those in front of the panelists. So, um, let's talk about looking forward. Shahid, let's start with you. Um, things are moving rapidly in all areas of technology and, and also in this area. Well, where do you see the discussion being five years from now, or what do you see uh, the key issues being in the future? Yeah, I'd look at it in probably three ways, uh, Anthony. One is that uh, um, current user interfaces that we've been using, accustomed to using over the last few years have been primarily point and click, uh, where you're presented with a couple of dialog boxes and you choose something or you enter data. And we need to start moving more to a what's referred to as conversational user interfaces. So if you've ever used Echo or Siri or uh, the, uh, Amazon's Alexa is the Echo uh, thing that I'm talking about, or Siri or uh, Google Now, you know that you can ask questions and get responses without having to click through a bunch of things. So what I'd like to see vendors starting to do is to say, what does it mean to have conversational uh, user interfaces that allow interactive conversations through a message-oriented or a communications-oriented platform? And five years from now, you're going to see uh, the advanced user interfaces. Just like five years ago, you didn't have very many that were touch-friendly, and now they are. These are going to be voice-friendly and communications-friendly, structured. And, you know, just like Alex said, we don't want these to be unstructured. So that's one uh, big area. The second area I'd like uh, to see people focus a little bit on is uh, seeing how there's notification overload alert uh, when a lot of messages come out, you start to see people communicating a lot more. When it's hard to pick up the phone and find somebody, you don't often send out a message because you're not going to leave a, mess a long voicemail message. But when you don't, when the cost of sending a message is literally zero, you see, you see more and more messages coming out. So products created that help digest that information so that you can see notifications coming out, you know, half an hour, one hour, collects all of those and presents those to you. So conversational UIs, a uh, big thing for us to look at. Number two uh, being in this area of making sure that notification bloat, uh, notification overload, alert fatigue, et cetera, digesting come in. And the last uh, thing I'd, I'd like to look at is uh, following where, as I, as I started at the beginning of the conversation, chatbots. Uh, so these are automated utilities that can have interactive conversations. So when you're trying to have patient provider conversations, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% of patients' questions are pretty common, that a chatbot could just respond, make it look like it's very uh, interactive. So I'd like to see, I I'd certainly believe that it's already happening in consumer internet, uh, but in this, in our healthcare B2B world, we should see, we should start to see these coming out over the next few years. So the future is bright, I think, in this uh, communications area, uh, and uh, there's a lot of great ways of making sure that uh, we improve uh, patient outcomes. Uh, using these kind of communication technologies. So the good news is that we don't have to develop all of it. Uh, we can start to integrate and build uh, these te technologies on existing uh, platforms and go from there instead of uh, having to, you know, rebuild from the ground up. Excellent. Terry, you want to give us some thoughts? Yeah, I think I think from our perspective, um, it, what 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 has been maybe a market category, as I described earlier, that's been fragmented uh, in the area of clinical communications, what's really emerging, and Gartner's, uh, Alex mentioned Gartner earlier, uh, their research would support it, is that there's, there's clearly an emerging need uh, and category around care team collaboration. And uh, we see the care team collaboration platform as one that unites all the clinicians across disparate care settings and is also tied into the EMR, so it's aware of what's happening in the EMR and it's able to use an, an intelligence to make clinicians aware of uh, the things they need to know about and doesn't bother them for things they don't need to know about. 
but we see this also, um, this, this uh, technology tying into, uh, tying into the patient, as I described earlier, through health and wellness platforms. Uh, and then uh, also um, the applications that would be sitting on top of the, uh, the, the big data analytics platform. So it's really, I think, about, uh, about uh, that mobile app uh, on that smartphone in your, your pocket uh, and not only being able to connect with, with anyone, but also the clinician being made aware of what's happening in these other technologies uh, in a way that, that makes their lives uh, more productive and helps them deliver better care. And that's certainly what we're focused on here at PerfectServe. Very good. Well, we're just about out of time. I do want to get one question in front of Terry Hayes. Um, this is going to be, I think, an interesting question, Terry. Um, okay. In some health systems uh, where, you, you know, a lot of health systems you have independent Physicians, they're not employees, but they're serving the patients that are in the hospital. Some, and, and now hospitals, uh, as we go to value-based care, hospitals are going to get paid based on outcomes. Therefore, they need those physicians that are independent to be delivering the proper care. Delivering the proper care means being responsive. It, are, are systems like yours going to help hospitals identify certain clinicians who are not responding in the way they need to be to patient needs, who are, let's say, hiding, making themselves less available than they should be. Are the technologies going to help the organizations find that out with data and address a problem physician issue? It's an excellent question. Um, yes, and, and there, all of the messaging that occurs within Perfect Serve is auditable. So you can see when a message was um, received, when it was open and read. So you can actually know when a provider has picked up a message. So there's no more saying, you know, I didn't, I didn't get that text or I didn't get that page mm -hmm. um, because you've got data to show that they did. Now, there's another thing that Terry talked about with the dynamic intelligent routing. There's also ways where if a provider doesn't answer within a certain amount of time, there's escalation paths. So, you know, for example, if, a, if it's a stroke and your um, neurologist on call doesn't answer within, you know, two or three minutes, you can escalate to um, the next neurologist. Or the same thing in a resident program, you can, you know, um, escalate to the attending. So, yes, that's, that's a very important um, part of our platform, and it's one of the things that um, that helps everybody stay accountable for the care of the patient. And you did ask another question about um, um, providers that are not based at the um, facility. There, there are some facilities that will even um, choose to add users who are, are not part of their medical staff if they're very key communicators in their system. And oftentimes the um, community providers, um, there's a benefit to being on perfect serve to the practice itself. So they'll oftentimes come on the communication platform as well. Excellent. Well, uh, that's about uh, all we had time for today. I want to um, remind folks as you close out today, please take a minute, uh, not even to answer our post-event survey. I want to thank our panel, Alex Rodriguez, Shahid Shah, Terry Edwards, Terry Hayes. I want to thank Perfect Serve Inc. for making this event possible. I've really enjoyed it. Um, as I mentioned, you'll receive an email when our archive has been posted to our YouTube channel. Each one of our events gets you one CEU towards the CHIME CHCIO certification. If you've asked us to let CHIME know you were here, we will. Um, if not, make sure you let CHIME know. Last slide on this deck is, um, actually we don't have that here, but if you need a certificate of attendance, you can contact Nancy Wilcox. Sponsorship opportunities, also contact Nancy Wilcox, and you can go to our site to view our upcoming schedule. So again, I want to thank our panel, our attendees. Everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.